welcome to another episode of Speak Out with Tim Wise, a project of Speak Out, the nation's premier nonprofit speakers bureau, which for over 25 years has been bringing educators and activists to campuses and communities across America to engage in meaningful dialogue about the pressing issues that confront our country and the world. If you enjoy the program, one way you can express your support is to become a monthly patron and sustainer of the show by signing up at www.patreon.com forward slash speak out with Tim Wise. You can pledge as little as $2 a month or as much as you'd like, and not only know that you're supporting our efforts, but also gain access to bonus content, like premium commentaries on the events of the week, as well as signed books or DVDs. You can also make a one-time donation to the program at speakoutnow.org via PayPal, and make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Speak Out with Tim Wise. I say back because those of you who have been following the show, subscribing to the show uh, since it started, know that I have been away for a few months. I want to apologize for that. I uh, was taking a break, sort of trying to reassess the direction of the program, figuring out how to continue to bring you uh, excellent programs, hopefully with fantastic interviews. I, I presume people have been enjoying it because the subscriptions have continued to go up, even though we haven't had a new episode for several months. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, me and the folks that speak out have been uh, have been sitting trying to figure out the marketing on it and you know anyone who's ever tried to do a podcast knows that uh, it takes a while to catch on it is incredibly time consuming and uh, it gotten the better of me there for a little bit I'll be perfectly honest but uh, I'm back in the swing of things and looking forward to uh, to producing some some good shows for you starting today going to be having a conversation uh, with Jonathan Metzel he is a professor at Vanderbilt University just across town actually uh, from where I live he is a professor of sociology and medicine health and society as as well as a professor of psychiatry at Vanderbilt. He's the director of the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society. He's written several books, the latest of which we'll be talking about today, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland, a fantastic book. And we had an excellent conversation, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll bring that to you here in a few seconds. I want to set that conversation up, though, and sort of talk about why I wanted to have uh, Jonathan on the show. This is the kind of thing, this discussion about the ironies of racial resentment and racial privilege and the way that whiteness and a politic of whiteness is actually dangerous even for uh, a large number of white people is the kind of stuff that I've been trying to talk about for many, many years. Uh, you know, I give talks about that. I've written things about that, but I've never quite been able to figure out how to put that together in like a scholarly volume. So I've always sort of um, put that off because I knew that wasn't my purview, right? And I just always hoped that somebody would come along and give some academic uh, scholarly credibility to this thing that to me has always been common sense and there's always been good anecdotal evidence and, and good analysis to say that whiteness is dangerous even for a lot of white people, but not necessarily the sort of quantitative evidence. Well, Jonathan Metzel has put that together. He has combined some really excellent storytelling interviews that he had with people around the country in different states, uh, as well as quantitative data to demonstrate conclusively that whiteness isn't just deadly and destructive for people of color in a system of racial inequity, but that there are these ironic blowback effects that a politics of whiteness, a politic of white racial resentment uh, is having even in white communities. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. The reason I wanted to do it was that for years, this has seemed to be the thing that has eluded those of us who talk about racism and those of us who talk about this issue known as white privilege, right? The, the problem with privilege discourse, I think, has been that unless you can give people a a strong reason why they should want to change a system that benefits them, uh, then they're not going to fight to change it. That's always been the catch-22, right? The more convincing you are that whiteness pays certain dividends, if you will, that white people have certain advantages relative to people of color just by virtue of being white, the more effective you are at selling that truth the more likely that those folks are going to go, even if they're good people, right? Even even if these white folks are good, caring, compassionate people, you can sort of hear the voice in the back of their head. Maybe it's the voice in the back of your head. Maybe it's the voice that has at times been in the back of my own, which says, well, God, you know, that sucks, but 
I mean, shit, if I'm winning, you know, maybe I want to keep on winning because we do live in a culture, don't we? Where, you know, if you've got an edge, you really are not encouraged to give that edge away, right? Even the old saying uh, that parents used to tell their kids, right? What they say, count your blessings. They didn't say count them and then give them away. Or they said uh, in my in my parents' day, parents used to tell uh, their kids, eat all your vegetables. There are children starving in China. Note what they didn't say, right? They did not say, my God, there are children starving in China. Why don't you box that shit up and send it over there instead of having seconds, right? They didn't say that, right? They encourage you to eat more. Oh yeah, there are people starving, but now that I mentioned that, don't dwell on that. Just go ahead and have seconds, have thirds, fill your bellies. Don't worry about those starving people, right? That's the culture in which we live. So if you convince somebody they have privilege, the incentive in, in America, man, is to double down on that, right? So that has always been sort of the catch-22. How do you convince white people that there's this unjust system that hurts some and actually benefits the rest of us, and yet also convince them that they too ought to want to change that? Because if you're waiting for white people to sort of act on that based on conscience alone, right? The idea that, oh my God, this is immoral. You're going to be waiting a really long time. Plus, I'm not sure that that's a lasting motivation because a person can get that pang of conscience or even that pang of really unproductive and unhelpful guilt, which has never liberated anyone from oppression. But then after a while, that eats away at you. And the more you dwell on that, the shittier you feel. So you now have an incentive to push it to the side, to push it down in your consciousness, to not act on it. If you're just acting on the basis of sort of altruism, it's real easy for altruism to go south and and to not last, right? Um, you need to have some, some skin in the game, so to speak. And the skin in the game is finding a reason why white folks should want to change systems of inequality, not just to quote unquote save other people, which is colonial at worst and, and even at best is a little rooted in charity rather than solidarity, right? It's a little obnoxious. It's a little, uh, you know, a little bit savior mentality, if you will. But because we ourselves have a stake in it, really, that's what we need. We need to be fighting the system because we ourselves are harmed by it, that we have some interest. And this is something that many years ago, I, I was having a conversation with the late and great uh, Professor Derek Bell, a longtime law professor at Harvard and then, of course, at NYU, who passed several years ago. And one of the things that Professor Bell, for those who ever took a class with him or knew him, you know, his thing within the realm of, of critical race theory and particularly critical legal studies, uh, he, he talked about the importance of what he called interest convergence. His theory was that really none of the progress that we had seen in the United States with regard to race had ever come about because of white conscience. It was never because white people suddenly uh, developed this great moral calibration that made us realize that white supremacy was this horrible evil. Rather, it was because the interest of black and brown people suddenly converged with the interest of most white people. And so he talks about that with regard to the, the Brown v. Board years and the early civil rights uh, victories as being directly connected to the fact that we were in the midst of the Cold War, where we we're trying to win a propaganda battle with the Soviet Union. It wasn't that white lawmakers suddenly grew a conscience, and it wasn't even because of the brilliance of the civil rights movement and its leadership. As much as it was brilliant, as, as important as that was, what his argument is, is that had it not been for the need to to sell the Western model, the quote-unquote free world, free market model to emerging countries that were escaping colonialism in Africa, in Asia, that it's very possible those victories don't happen. But if we continue to be this apartheid state, it was going to be really hard to convince those countries to go our direction rather than to become part of the Soviet orbit. And so in a, in a real sense, it's always been about interest convergence. And that may seem cynical to people. I know folks don't like to hear that. We want people to do the right thing for the right reason. But history History tells us that that just isn't oftentimes what we do. And so Professor Bell and I were having this conversation and he said to me that that was the holy grail of this work. He said, if, if, if any of y'all can figure out why it is that white people should want to change this system, you will have found the holy grail. And, and he wasn't sure that it was out there and I wasn't sure that it was out there. And a lot of people have tried different approaches. Sort of doctrinaire Marxists have always argued, well, you know, the working class uh, is harmed by racial division in the labor market because the more divided the working class, the easier for the capitalist class, owning class, rich folks to manipulate workers and pit them against each other and ultimately drive down the wages for all of them, right? Drive down the benefits for all of them to, to break the union, for instance, by manipulating racial fears. And that is, in fact, what happened, right? We know that the union movement was affected by the manipulation of bosses who would pit workers against one another. And one of the reasons that those of us in the South didn't have 
have strong unions was because racist organizers, oftentimes Klansmen and others, would, would argue that you didn't want unions because unions would mean solidaristic wages, right? It would mean that white men and black men, and it usually was men in those days, would be getting paid the same to work on the assembly line or to work on the farm. And you don't want to get paid the same as a black person, my God, because it essentially would devalue the value of your skin, right? That it would uh, diminish the uh, the social capital of what W.E.B. Du Bois called the psychological wage of whiteness so that white folks would accept less, including no unions and shitty wages and awful working conditions, just so long as they could stay above black people. And the sort of traditional left argument was that if workers just understood their commonality of interest with black and brown workers, that we could build a multiracial movement of workers uh, and fight capital and fight the quote unquote real enemy. Of course, in reality, it was never this easy. Um, the psychologically embedded racial hostility that has been cultivated for so many generations does not simply go away because you demonstrate that, oh, you know, you'd make $4 more an hour or $20 more a week or $1,000 more a year or something uh, if you just got together with your black brother and sister because it isn't just pocketbook stuff that's keeping you from doing that in the first place. There's a whole lot more, right, than just the material interest that motivates people. Uh, and especially, you know, working class and struggling white folks, right? The more struggling you are, the more that your whiteness matters. Like, if you're rich enough, your white skin is just sort of redundant. I mean, you know, I suppose in a system of white supremacy, it's nice to have, but uh, you got enough green, so to speak, to get you through. But if you're one of those white folks who is struggling, then the property interest that you have, if you will, uh, in your whiteness, as Cheryl Harris at UCLA Law School puts it, you know, this sort of um, whiteness as property concept, or George Lipsitz talk about the possessive investment of whiteness. The poorer you are as a white person, the more important your whiteness becomes because it's like literally all you have. So the idea that you can just go to a working class white person and point out how wretched their economic condition is and that's going to make them not want to be racist is is absolutely exactly the opposite of how racism really works with working class people. But it was sort of the traditional Marxist line. I remember doing the work against David Duke in the early 90s. My, my more doctrinaire Marxist friends, you know, they would just say, all oh, these were white Marxist friends. My black and brown Marxist friends knew better, but my white Marxist friends would say, we just need to go into the chemical plants and tell these guys that are working at the chemical factory, you know, that David Duke and racism are bad for their bottom line. And, you know, and it, just like I, I said, OK, you know, good luck with that. Let me know how that goes for you, because I just never suspected that would do it. And several years ago, 19 years now, almost 20 years ago, I wrote a piece that was on the Confederate flag. It was when South Carolina was debating whether or not they were going to uh, remove the Confederate flag from their state house. And I've written a piece, you know, explaining with obvious historical references that the motivations behind the Confederate States of America were, you know, from top to bottom uh, about white supremacy and the maintenance of slavery. And so I did this whole piece talking about that. And then, of course, I got a ton of email from, you know, every branch, it seemed, of the Sons of Confederate Veterans and all these. And this was back, you know, this is 2000. So this is before social media, right? It's, it's, it's before, hell, this is before Google, right, even existed. I think everybody was using Yahoo or Netscape in those days. And, you know, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no social media, there weren't even blogs yet. Uh, it was just sort of, you know, sort of early websites and listservs, email listservs. And that was where I was getting all this response. It got on every right wing neo-Confederate listserv out there. And then all these guys would blast me, you know, with the same neo-Confederate propagandistic bullshit. Well, one young man got into this thing with me and he, he wrote me, he was all kinds of hostile at first, um, you know, screaming and yelling about this, that, and the other, and, you know, trying to say that, uh, Confederate flag wasn't about racism, but then he would, you know, proceed to make all kinds of racist comments that made it pretty obvious that if it wasn't about racism, he sure as shit wished it had been because he was clearly carrying around a lot of racism. But uh, I indulged him for some reason. I don't know. I was in a good mood. Sometimes I do this, right? Sometimes you catch me on a good day and, I, you know, I'll indulge the bullshit for a minute. Um, so I'm going back and forth with this kid. He was from South Carolina. His name was uh, name was Randy. I won't say his last name, but Randy and I were going back and forth about this. And, and I was trying to use all the powers of persuasion at my fingertips, right? And I'm trying to explain how the Confederacy and segregation afterward and just racism generally in our region, the South that he and I shared, had really impoverished everyone in the South, had made our schools shittier, had guaranteed that we had worse health care, guaranteed that 
you know, our safety nets were marginal, our uh, wage base was lower, workers, you know, had less life expectancy because the working conditions were worse. And all of that was connected to racism because for so long, the hardest work was being done by black folks. And so Southern lawmakers did not want uh, labor protections, right? They didn't want, um, hell, they fought even things like social security for 20 years because they didn't want it to apply to agricultural workers. And that was where a disproportionate number of black folks did work in the agricultural economy of sharecroppers, for instance. Uh, but of course, that also hurt white folks, didn't it, who were working as sharecroppers or who were working on, on farms. And so a lot of the sort of bad labor policies and the, and the horrible working conditions that Southern workers generally of all races experience can be directly tied to this legacy of racism. So I go through the whole history and I lay it out for him. And, and then finally, I don't know, a couple hours in, he breaks his silence and he writes back and he goes, you know, you're probably right about all of this. And there was that part of me that was like, aha, good, I, I've, I've proved my point. But he says, however, and that was when I knew I was in trouble. He said, however, I have to be honest, I would be willing to work for a dollar an hour if we could just go back to segregation. And I remember staring at my screen in that moment and realizing, holy hell, there is nothing more that I can say. I've just convinced this guy that white people's economic interests are devastated by holding on to things like racism and the division of racism within the labor market, education, all of these things. He's granted me every single one of my substantive arguments, and yet his fallback is, yeah, you're right, but I'd be willing to work for a dollar an hour. Keep in mind, that's 40 bucks a week, y'all. $40 a week he's willing to work for. If he can just go back to segregation, why? He didn't say, but the answer is sort of obvious, right? The answer is, if we go back to segregation, he would be able to feel better than someone. He would be able to feel superior to someone. And his need to feel better than someone is actually so strong that he'd be willing to basically starve to death just in order to indulge it. And that was the day when I realized all the economic arguments in the world about solidarity and the, you know, benefits of black and white together holding hands, fighting the bosses, that that just was never going to work for some people. It's not that it can't work for some people. I'm not saying that that argument should be abandoned. First of all, it's true. Workers would be better off with a politic of solidarity. So it's always worth telling the truth, even if people don't want to hear it, even if it doesn't change their mind. But you can't put all of your sort of hopes in the idea that that's going to work. So after that, I kept thinking, well, hell, if it's not economics that's going to do it, what in the world is going to do it? And the only thing that I could come up with was this hope that, well, maybe the issue isn't just about economics. Maybe it's about health. Maybe if we could show white folks that their actual lives are endangered by this politic of whiteness, that a politic of white resentment is so dangerous that it leads to policies that actually will kill us, maybe that'll do it. And so, you know, I'd come up with various examples of that, you know, the way that a politic of whiteness, for instance, uh, led us not to care about uh, the drug crisis in the 70s when there was a heroin epidemic in urban America, black and brown communities disproportionately, or the crack epidemic in the 80s that disproportionately affected black and brown low income communities. And we didn't care enough because the people dying or going to prison were mostly black and brown. And so we didn't put money in rehabilitation, drug education, rehab and treatment, right? We put the money in incarceration. Uh, locked away uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people over the course of a 30 to 40 year period. And um, now we're in the middle of a new drug epidemic that although it affects everyone, there has been a disproportionate effect in white small town rural communities, the opioid epidemic, right? So there's a good example of how a politic of white resentment and a politic of racism that said, screw those people. We don't care about those people. They're the ones doing the suffering. We don't care. Lock them up, throw away the key. And now you got white families, right? That are wondering, where's the rehab money? Where's treatment? Why don't we have a policy to deal with this? Well, it's because of a politic of white resentment. And I do think for some people that can be eye-opening. Uh, and yet, here's the thing, having read my guest today, his book, Dying of Whiteness, What You Will Discover, and it is not a happy uh, reality to discover, but it is one that we have to confront if we're going to figure out how to build a politic of solidarity, is what Jonathan Metzl found, which is that even when confronted with the prospects of death, 
even when you have lost loved ones, even when you yourself are staring death in the face, there is an extent to which the politics of white resentment will keep you from doing the things that you know you should do and will push you to doing things that you know you shouldn't. Opposing healthcare policies that you yourself need and would benefit from, but that you want to not support and not be a part of because you don't want your tax dollars going to quote unquote those people. Or fighting for easier gun access than ever. Guns everywhere, in bars, in restaurants, in churches, in schools, on playgrounds, everywhere. The right to bear arms and carry them with you on your hip by God because you gotta protect yourself against those marauding bands of, you know, those people once again. And then it turns out that in states that have done that, and he looks specifically at the state of Missouri, there's been a marked increase in gun deaths, but not people defending themselves from marauding bands of whomever, 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 but a massive increase in the number of gun deaths by suicide, disproportionately overwhelmingly suicides by who? By white men. And this has happened since the relaxation of, of gun laws uh, in the state of Missouri. So anyway, I don't want to give away too much. I'm going to talk about that with Jonathan Metzl. But what it says, right, is that we're still looking for that holy grail. What is it going to take to get white struggling and working class people to wake up and stop voting against their own interest or stop voting? I shouldn't say against their interest because white interest as white people are, they've been defined as an interest. White people do have an interest, I suppose, in cleaving to whiteness. It does pay certain dividends. So I don't want to just chalk it up to what Marx would have called false consciousness. It's not that. It's just alternative consciousness. It's defining interest in a particular way that is, I believe, dysfunctional and pathological. But how in the world are we going to build a politic of solidarity when that is so deeply rooted in an awful lot of white folks and when politicians know that and take advantage of that and manipulate voters on the basis of it? I'm going to talk to Jonathan Metzl about all of that and more in just a second. Stick with us and we'll be back with Speak Out with Tim Wise. start with an anecdote that uh, happened to us. We, we both sort of experienced this in real time the other day on Twitter. I had tweeted out a number of, of things recommending your book and talking about why I thought it was so important, trying as best I could to sum up this notion that uh, indeed, ironically, the, the politics of, of white racial resentment and fear and anxiety has in so many instances, many of which you document in the book, uh, led white folks to support a politic that is really not in the vast majority of our interest and indeed hurts uh, millions of white people every year. And into the breach of those tweets, uh, which at that point you had joined on that thread as well, of course, came the, I don't know whether they were trolls or people who genuinely believe what they're saying, but either way, right, making the argument, well, you people are anti-white, and this is typical. And, and of course, the irony being... The point I was trying to make, and certainly the point you're trying to make in this book, is anything but anti-white people. If anything, it's saying that there's a real damage that comes to white folks from indulging a politic of white racial resentment and anxiety. So the first question, I guess, that I have for you is, um, what is it that made you want to look at that particular piece? Because... Oftentimes, when we talk about race and the politics of race, naturally, we focus, as understandably we should, on the damage of racial inequity to peoples of color. This is obviously a spin on that, and you talk about that in the book, but you connect it to this broader damage. What made you want to look at that particular issue as it relates to the current political moment that we find ourselves in? I guess I started the book uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that I'm somebody who, I myself, am a white Midwesterner. I grew up in Kansas City, uh, Missouri about two blocks from Kansas, and the Kansas City that I grew up in was a place where people had dramatically different ideological, political positions, even about many of the hot-button issues today. You know, people disagree about health care and schooling and guns and all these kind of things. Um, but, but there was always an underlying sense that even if people disagreed about things, that at, at the end of the day, we were going to figure out some way to work, work it out. But what happened was then I left Kansas City. Um, I started moving around for my career. But my parents still lived there. And every time I would go back, I would see people getting divided about issues that they didn't used to argue about. And particularly these kind of issues, all of a sudden, obviously, racial divides were getting much more intense. Part of it was this message that started in the kind of early 2000s. It had been there for a long time, but not a, in a dominant way that 
white America was under attack, that white people were getting ripped off by immigrants and minorities who wanted to take away resources from them. Um, and it led to what it looked like to me a, a series of really complicated and, and in a way disastrous decisions, you know, decisions to let guns in everywhere so people could protect themselves. In Kansas, um, a logic that let people cut away the tax base that funded the fantastic public school system and the roads and the bridges, blockage in Missouri of the Affordable Care Act and no Medicaid expansion. And, and so all these decisions seemed to pile up. And what I saw was that as people started to make these kind of decisions, not just individually, but politically, voting for politicians who were implementing policies that were based on this sense of resentment, that it had their disastrous consequences across the state, and particularly so for working class communities. And in many instances, also white working class communities. Um, you know, the dropout rates surged after Kansas cut its school budgets, and the people most affected were white white, lower-income people who were in public school, children. Uh, gun deaths, the highest rate of gun deaths were white, rural men um, who were committing gun suicide. And so, in a way, there was this story happening in the Kansas City of my youth that now became the Kansas City that's now the one that's in this book um, that I wanted I wanted to tell that, that story about. And it turned out, after that, I ended up moving back to Tennessee, and I saw many of the same factors playing out in Tennessee. So it was a very personal book for me out of a sense of not just trying to highlight the cost of these decisions, but also having known a time where we could – we I've seen us do better. And that's what struck me about the book was, yes, number one, it, it was very personal in the sense that you shared some of that personal background of your own, but also the conversations you had with families and people in, let's say, in Missouri who had lost children to suicide or in Tennessee, people who were desperately in need of better health care, but in many cases were willing to forego it even when they needed it, or people in Kansas who would rationalize these, these budget cuts. And of course, there was also, and you did include, the voices of those who clearly were starting to think some of those previous commitments before we get into the costs that as you say white folks are paying and that's why you know you're talking about dying of whiteness let's talk a little bit about the extent to which those decisions and those policies that people have supported are connected to racial resentment because I'm sure there would be skeptics out there who would say hold on hold on just because you don't want to expand Medicaid or just because you don't want uh, the Affordable Care Act or just because you don't want to continue lavishing funds quote unquote upon the existing K-12 public school system, or just because you want guns available, doesn't mean that it's about race. Why, goodness, we have to protect ourselves, or or we just don't believe in big government. I mean, sort of the you know the conservative mantra for years has been we just don't think that the federal government should do X, Y, or Z, or we believe in individual you know self defense with weapons. And and they would argue, of course, that it isn't about race. So how is it that we can rest assured that at least part of this politic uh, is connected to a racialized sense of self versus other. For the most part, what I argue in the book is that the racial tinge of these issues and others comes from two main factors. One is the history of particular issues. So I spend a lot of time explaining in the healthcare chapter how there's a long history of resistance to government programs and government health care in the South that dates back to efforts to integrate uh, Southern hospitals and, and make them racially mixed, or even resistance to Social Security and factors like that. And part of the resistance had to do with Southern fears that basically this was going to upend the racial hierarchy of the South. Guns have a very long racial history, about a 200-year racial history of guns and white privilege being aligned with each other. And I go blow by blow through the laws and representations of basically these assumptions that carrying a gun is a white man's privilege. And Kansas schools has, of course, the history of the Brown versus Board of Education um, desegregation of schools case. Uh, and so part of what I do is try to show in the, in the, in the book how even if people aren't talking about racist things, and many of the people are just honestly trying to live their lives. They are, they're not trying to be racist. But the issues themselves are, are already racialized in ways that shape our present day debates. And so it's not so much what's in people's minds, it's the issues themselves. And that leads me to the second point, which is those issues and the racial histories of those issues then shape the public policies, right? And so the, just the ways that policies are enacted, open carry of firearms, is set, it says it's a 
policy for everyone, but it turns out mostly white men become the people who are open carrying and black men who try to do so are taking down the school case, you know, this assumption that basically we're going to cut away from minority districts, et cetera, et cetera. So it really ended up being a question of policies, not people. And I try to show how the history of race in the South and the West shapes the ways that these policies come into being or supported and then are enacted. Yeah, I think that's an important historical and contemporary distinction, because so often when we talk about the racial component of these things, people hear it as an individual condemnation, right? So it's about, you're calling me racist, and, and then of course it becomes, well, I'm not, and here let me prove I'm not, and then that gets very messy and usually absurd, and, and, and it's not the point, right? Because the issue is, if you have certain subjects like government expenditure on those in need, whether that's health care, whether that's housing, uh, you know, income support, nutrition assistance, or uh, whether it's something like guns or whether it's something like public schooling. And those things, if they have become associated in the public mind and even more than the public mind, the political system with a, a racial spoil system so that they the assumption is the people who benefit from these expenditures will be disproportionately those people and not us. There doesn't have to be overt bigotry, right, involved in the reaction to that. It's simply that these things now, that the notion of small government can't be divorced from a politics of, of racial scapegoating because for at least a half century, they have been so explicitly connected that we make those connections in our mind, maybe at a subconscious level, maybe at a conscious level, but, but it's certainly, it's almost impossible, isn't it, to talk about limited government in, in the United States context, and we can talk about it philosophically, and, but in the real world, those two things, race and limited government, have not been separate in this country, maybe ever, certainly not for the last half century or more. That's beautifully said. I mean, I can't tell you, since the book's come out, it's been um, almost two weeks now, I've been asked a hundred times already, do you think Donald Trump is a racist? And I'm, I'm much more interested in what the, what the effects of President Trump's actions are. And it's the same thing in, in these states, right, that all of these policies have profoundly, profoundly racial implications. So to me, it's secondary, you know, what, what somebody's emotional state is or what their identity is. It's really what happens. Um, and, and I think you're exactly right that, that it, in a way, that, that has become the catchword. I mean, I, I've met many people who generally believe in small government, and I think that it's important. You know, if I was a small business owner in Kansas, I'm sure that part of that would resonate with, with me as well. So it's not like I'm saying that that is inherently an evil ideology. But as you suggest, if you did completely divorce that from the other theme that I found again and again and again, which was, I don't want my tax dollars going to people who are lazy, um, right. things like that, like these profoundly kind of this assumption. And it was even true, I mean, the, probably the most striking was when I was doing focus groups about the Affordable Care Act in very, very low income um, housing communities in Tennessee. There were white men who had been, you know, working class white men who fell down. There was no safety net to catch them until they ended up in, the, in these low income housing uh, communities. Everybody around the table was getting government assistance because of the, living in the housing community. And, and many were not employed because of chronic illness. And they repeatedly told me, I don't want my tax dollars going to people who are, who are lazy. So there's this idea of I'm working hard and other people are gaming the system. And, and part of what I, I mean, part of it was... Of course, the profound irony of people in that setting making that kind of argument, right? And so, and so I'm sure there was a level of kind of shame about it, um, this idea that they didn't want to be seen as taking a hand out themselves, which um, was very powerful and, and was hard not to be empathic about that. But, but, but the thing that gets missed in that formulation, as I try to point out, is, is not just about race or racism. It's really that, first of all, we all do much, much worse if the whole system doesn't work better, and so when you when you don't have infrastructure and support and safety nets, it actually hurts everybody in the society, right. not just the lowest income people. And the other thing, which is the profound, you know, Du Bois on down have noted this. It was interesting that all of the ire of men in these groups was directed downward. You know, immigrants and minorities who they felt like were potentially taking resources that were theirs, but none of it was directed upward at upper class white populations or corporations who it seemed clear to me in doing the interviews were far far more 
causally related to the conditions that men found themselves in, but there was no anger directed upward. So I talked to people who are, as I said, chronically medically ill and in these, you know, end of the road kind of communities, families who lost loved ones to uh, to gun suicide, etc. And I thought, well, these, I mean, I chose those locations in part because I, I mean, they were kind of end, end points where I thought, is this the place where we could have a kind of conversation? So part of the issue, but I, I want to emphasize just part of it, is that what I found actually is replicated in some other studies, which is that in, when people are more in more dire circumstances, they actually become more ideological, ideologically connected, not less. And so, you know, we see this after mass shootings, for example, people become more pro-gun after mass shootings. And so it wasn't a total surprise, but it was still very powerful to see it in practice that um, at the, this this was the moment where people became, you know, I would ask people, this changed your attitude about guns, and they would always tell me it wasn't the gun's fault. The other thing I found in my research were the many ways in which this idea of win at all costs whiteness, or you might not be able to climb the ladder, but um, you sure don't want to fall down it. But and, and that was so clearly manipulated. It wasn't just coming from white people's brains. There were also so many forces that were playing on that anxiety. I certainly think President Trump is a master at that. But even like in the book, I show some gun advertisements that talk about, I mean, the taglines in some of these gun ads are, you know, restore the balance of power, restore your privilege. Get your I mean, man card really, back, right? The Bushmaster yeah. ad. Yeah. It, and it's remarkable but basically it's just playing right to this to say you know you lost this privilege and here's a way to get it back by buying a gun here create gun, gun identity I also came to believe that Twitter plays right into this as well because without nuance or contact or empathy or anything like that it's just this polarization really really plays right into that and so I guess what I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that I think it's important to note that this isn't just about a construction of whiteness that there are many entities that actually benefit and I mean benefit financially from from playing on and exacerbating that kind of anxiety and also keeping Americans polarized so that we can't figure out you know common sense issues regarding life and death and so the question i have for you then is when folks who are clearly in need of changes in policy, whether it is they need affordable care, they need pre-existing conditions to be covered, but they are unwilling. And you you quote one guy who says he'd rather die than go on the Affordable Care Act because he didn't want his tax dollars going to illegal immigrants or whatnot. And of course, he, he does die. When you've got people like that, or you have people who've lost loved ones, some of the most wrenching stories have to do with folks who've lost their, their loved ones to suicide. And you know, they're, they're blaming themselves. They're asking every question about what they could have done. Could they have seen the warning signs? And the one thing they don't want to talk about is this thing that they that they are so connected to, the notion of gun culture and, and oftentimes rationalized, as you note in the book, by fear of, of home invaders. And, you know, again, these people like in rural Missouri, who, you know, are, they're, they're not even, there are no marauding bands of anybody coming to get them. They're thinking about post-Ferguson. I mean, you talk about how the, the some of the gun relaxations in Missouri happened right in the wake of the Ferguson uprising after Mike Brown was killed is when they, you know, it started before that, but it really sort of ramps up after that. So it's clear that people are thinking and being manipulated to think in terms of the dangerous other. So the question then is, how in the world, especially because there is this, as you say, this psychological thing that happens when we're afraid of death, this this notion of danger does cause us to become more ideologically rigid and usually in a reactionary way. How do you steer people away from that? If people will not even defend their own life enough to get the health care they need or to put down the guns that their kids are using to kill themselves how in the world do we do we create a politics of solidarity well there there are three ways to answer that that i can think of because of course this is a question that has befuddled thinkers um for a century right um you know if, if the Du Bois' amazing book on Reconstruction basically argued, gosh, we've come so far in this country, why are we still holding on to this ideology of race as divisive? Because if you think about it, if the newly freed slaves who became black 
uh, laborers and white day laborers would join together. That would be an immovable political force that could demand all these kind of concessions from the elites. So why why aren't people doing that? And then everybody since then has kind of asked the same question. Um, and now, for example, the progressive movement, I think, is the rumblings of, of an attempt to address at least part of that. It's important to note that there are many, many factors that prevent that from happening. And one, of course, is um, the entire Republican Party. And I say that because if working class white people would have said, yeah, we're Republican, but we actually want a good healthcare system, or we want good roads, or we want good schools for our kids, if they would have said that, the entire Republican Party platform collapses in a way. So part of the platform depends on this implicit, and I show quite explicit, um, assumption that white working class bodies, in addition to other bodies, are expendable, right? White working class people really need, literally need to lay down on the tracks in order for the entire platform to to succeed. And so part of what I argue, and I, I wrote a piece about this in Vice uh, last week, is, you know, I get asked a lot, um, when are people going to work and um, wake up? And I, I think really a good part of this has to come from the quote-unquote base, white working class uh, populations, who themselves, it's not like you're going to talk somebody out of these deep ideologies, but I do think it's fair to expect them to demand more of their politicians. In other words, to say, what are you doing for me on all these very practical, you know, home and health and security and education? Um, What are you doing for me practically? So, Part of the issue is not about changing anybody's mind from the outside. It's actually a much more organic refusal to accept what's happening. We haven't seen that yet. I guess part of me really thinks that there's not going to be a change until there's a change coming from within. So it also frustrates me that for a long time, I mean, I was doing this research when Hillary Clinton deplorable's comment came out, and I thought, like, it's we're gone. Like I thought, that's <laughs> yeah. you know that was the worst possible thing, and it and it was it was because um, because it just played into people's fears that the that, that that the Democratic Party was not looking out for their interests at all. And well, I, yeah, let me let, let let's talk yeah. about that because I I think that I remember when she made the comment. There, I had I was of two minds, right? On the one hand, I said, well, <laughs> I can look at the research and I can look at the polling about what. A significant number of Trump supporters believe, and the majority of them, you know, according to the research, believe Barack Obama was not born in America. The majority of them have incredibly retrograde views about Islam. And on the one hand, uh, I could say, uh, you know, her 50 percent or deplorable comment, depending on what she means by that, could have been an underestimate. At the same time, however, I also realized that politically it was the most absurd thing for a skilled politician to have ever said, and especially because, and it was unkind, so it was also just, it was just a sort of a unnecessarily unkind comment to convey the point she wanted to make. I always thought the way she could have gone about that and the way that, that we who really care about social justice ought to be going about it is to say to those voters who are currently, let's say, in the orbit of Trumpism, uh, granted, there's a certain percentage of them who really wouldn't care if he shot somebody on Fifth Avenue, and I'm not sure we can ever reach them. But there's another softer underbelly of that support. And I felt like if she had said, you know what, Don, rather than calling them deplorable, if, if she had said, you know what, Donald Trump thinks you're so racist that yeah. you that you will be convinced to hurt yourself just to get back at so and so. Right. In other words, I'm not calling you deplorable. I'm not calling you racist. He is. He's that's the one. It's, it's a master shirt. That's a, and, and in a way, that's really true. <laughs> so, um, so I, again, I think that that's the issue. I mean, the Democratic Party has, for a long time. I mean, there are obviously racial politics behind why. Dixiecrats became Republicans, right. um, but um, but but the, the Democratic Party has risen many votes, not just white working class votes. Um, when it convinced people and then followed through and meant it that they, that they were looking out for working class interests um, in not, in not just coastal areas of this country, and so you know I, I think that I even get frustrated when people call it the base as if it's like this thing that will never move and never change. You know, right, right. Um, you know I think that people are making strategic decisions based on the material realities of their lives, and and I think that until recently that the, you know the Democrats kind of forgot that. Um, and not again that they have to have a platform that tries to woo Trump supporters. But but I but I would think that some issues, if framed correctly, I think there are some problems with how things are potentially being framed right now. Yeah. Um, but um, 
But I still think there's an important lesson of not giving up, and I, and I think exactly your framing it is is what really should have, should have been said and could have been said. Well, it seems to me that that the the big issue that that Democrats have and that and that sort of more moderate leaning liberals have is they they want to and maybe even some that are quite committed on the left but white is they they want to have this class conversation but they they don't quite know how to connect it to the race conversation they're either afraid to connect it because that will reinforce the racial resentment or fears or they just don't have a lot of experience and skill in connecting it and so they they just want to stay with class and it seems to me that and your book documents this so well that if these you know, socioeconomic and racial issues are so connected and the politics of racial resentment is affecting the decisions people make. We, we, we can't run away from the way these things have been racialized. We can't just say, for instance, hey, we all need better health care, so let's get better health care. We all need more public funding, because if in my mind, subconsciously, I'm connecting public anything to black people and brown people, which is what the research says people do. If I'm connecting the notion of government intervention in the economy, whether it's health care, housing, income support, schools, or anything else, with those people, the idea that you can finesse me and not mention it actually is bad because that allows me to remain in this sort of bubble of innocence where I'm not even having to confront the way I'm being manipulated. I, you know, if the subconscious stuff does a bigger number on me precisely because it stays subconscious. Whereas if a politician is willing to say, for 50 years, these folks have manipulated us, not you, us, all of us, to connect the dots between anything for people in need, working people, and this notion of unjustified others taking things from you, and making that connection explicit so that people have to really grapple with the way that we're being played off against each other. And, and, and sometimes I don't see that piece in like the way Bernie Sanders talks about this stuff where he just sort of, I think, skates around race or the way that a lot of traditional organizers who come out of sort of white models and didn't get grounded in race early on, they sort of, you know, they talk around it as if, as if simply appealing to rational self-interest will work but as as i think your book makes clear like there are interests however twisted they may be that are served psychological needs that are met by this politic of resentment by what du bois called the psychological wage of whiteness when he used that term he knew what he was talking about even in an age when we didn't have all the psych research that we have now like there it wasn't that they were voting against their interests they were defining their interests differently be, uh, be, beautifully put. I mean, I'm I'm so torn about um, the Bernie Sanders question that you bring up because on one hand, I do think there's a lot of promise of thinking about issues that will um, join potentially join people and unite people uh, um, across you know class lines. But my my framework is race here, and very consciously so. And and part of it, on one hand, is to say that there's not us and them. In other words, there is white privilege in this country, and the examples I'm going to show you are exaggerated examples of similar systems of privilege that surround me when I walk down the street, and I have to be honest about that. And so part of it is it's too easy for white liberals to say them when it when when that is not them right and so part of it that's part of that's part of the issue i think but then when when like for example let's take you know um a, a, an appeal to medicare for all there's a long history of resistance to government sponsored health care in, in the south more recently like five years ago with the response to Obamacare. Right. And so to just jump in and say, oh, yeah, we have this great idea that's government-sponsored health care for everybody without addressing the racial politics of that issue, uh, to me, is, a, is is the wrong way to go about it without having also a conversation about whiteness. Same thing with guns, jumping in and saying, we want universal background checks with also an, an understanding right. how guns have been tied to issues of whiteness and, and openly talking about that. Well, since the book came out, and you said it's been a couple of weeks now, and, uh, you know, it's been... And it, it's been really, I think, well received, probably more so than than you had even expected. And I know from our conversations, more than your publisher had expected, which is always <laughs> good when you when you impress your publisher. That's always a good sign. When it, when you think about reaction to the book, and I mean everything from tweets, which I know are you know, obviously outliers sometimes, to questions that have been asked by media people to emails. What, what has been the reaction and what does the reaction tell you, both the good and the bad reaction, tell you about this particular moment and, and, and what of that reaction makes you hopeful and what of that reaction still deeply concerns you? 
you know, it's funny because I mean, you and I talked about this before. I mean, I I love that this book is doing well, <laughs> and not just not just personally, but for the conversation in the field, right? I I probably have. 300 rejections along the way of <laughs> people or publishers or agents or different kinds of people it's hard it was hard to find people who believe that this was a topic and so for scholars out there who are thinking about this you know i'll let you come over and go through my my i have like three rejection drawers now of wow. stuff but you know um so it really took a lot but i hopefully the, the fact that um that this is tapping into something that will be encouraging for people to address this more because part of what I feel is like, look at what we lose by not talking about whiteness. And as one example of that, you know, all the media coverage of gun death in this country is either, you know, the NRA's gangbanger, carjacker thing, or, or mass shootings, right? But it turns out two thirds of gun death in this country is white male gun suicide. But because we can't talk about whiteness, right. and we can't talk about men, and we can't, whatever, that's invisible. So it's not just like invisible power, it's actually invisible suffering. And so I do think that there's a there's a moment here where we can hopefully build on this. And so that part for me has been encouraging that there, that actually just the fact that we're having these conversations at all, to me is terrific and we'll see for me it's interesting right we talked about this in the very beginning of the interview that my last book was a book about black power and racism and psychiatric diagnosis and i used to go over on tv all the time i was on tv probably every two weeks talking about racism in the medical system and i mean some really powerful stuff and I, what I found all the time when I was on TV was when I was a white man talking about racism, it was, it was something, something clicked. And then I would turn to, oh, and let's also talk about, I'm, I'll never forget it. There was a, I remember that um, North Carolina murderer, there was a parking lot dispute for some, um, I think, UNC students who oh, were yeah. um, Hindu or Muslim, and yeah. he, he shot them. And, and I said on television, this is a new form of white terrorism. This idea that people can armed white men who uh, think that they're, you know, they're they're the defenders of their own parking spaces, and and it, it, that is true, right? Because before, you know, a lot of the Supreme Court stuff in 2008, sure. you, individuals couldn't really carry their own weapons. But every time I would talk about whiteness on television. It's like, if you were a white man talking about whiteness, and I'm sure you get this too, you're like, you're a race trainer all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. And so there's something that feels very risky, but I think that's what we need to push through. Well, there is this defensiveness because I think, and I don't know what the defensiveness means. It's disheartening when someone comes on the Twitter feed as they did the other day and says, well, you just hate white people or you're just, you're just Jews. That's why you do it, which is a whole nother piece, right? I don't, I don't even know if you are Jewish. I am, but you know, whatever. I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and that, we'll see that just proves we're part of some horrible conspiracy to, <laughs> to save white people's lives by stopping white supremacy. It's a, it's a, it's a very twisted scheme we have figured out. But uh, the, the thing that is so disturbing, I, I I want to take something positive from it too, and that is I feel like sometimes that defensiveness is coming from a place that at its core could be a good place. And I could be horribly naive about this, but I feel like to some extent that's a person who deep down knows that this shit is pretty twisted and deep down knows that solidarity is a better way forward than division. And deep down they know that this is dangerous stuff for everyone. And yet, if they hear you saying it, or they hear other white folks saying it, me and others, there is that sense of like, well, I should be saying it too, but I'm not. Screw it, you know. And it's almost like a, a sense of I don't know. It's not guilt or shame. It's just a sense of, damn it, how can you say these things? I don't. It's almost like you know, you make people's lives more complicated when you give them these kinds of truths, preferably, hopefully, for a good purpose, but in a way that they're not always incredibly comfortable with and I think that's the thing about this particular moment that's so uh, incredible is that the band-aid has sort of been pulled off the the scab or the or the sore the horrible metaphors that I'm using but you know what I mean like we're we're having to look at this thing in the face and I do hope that some of those white folks including some of the folks that you talked to in the book who it, it did seem that they're they're having that in many cases that initial recognition that something is off here that perhaps uh, if we if we continue to talk about this and if we continue to make it very clear that the damage of these politics is widespread, that it isn't just uh, folks of color, though it is them first and foremost, but it's also the rest of us. And perhaps, uh, you know, sometime in the in the near or at least in the future, if not near future, uh, we'll be able to build coalitions uh, more rapidly or, you know, perhaps. And, and this is the skeptic and the cynic in me but you know it, it, i guess if we have to 
then we'll just have to figure out a way to defeat the, the people who cling to those politics and drag them kicking and screaming to universal health care, which will save their lives. Like, we'll just have to, sorry, guys, we're just going to make you have health care and we're just going to make you have good schools and you can thank us later. Like, there's part of me that uh, sometimes I feel like that, too. You know, we have to mobilize our side as well as show compassion for the other side in the hopes that maybe they'll come over. Yes. I mean, part of the irony of the book is one of the main arguments is whiteness is creating the conditions that are accelerating its own demise. But I will say that all along the way, and just in my life, I mean, there's so many examples of fantastic generosity and bravery. And, you know, I, again, I think that what we need right now are models. I, it just really pisses me off that Donald Trump is the guy that gets to t- define and speak to this idea of what it means to be white in America right now, because I think we need better models, right? Some some narrative that's going to combat that and say, hey, look, we can do uh, do a lot better. And that'll do it for another episode of Speak Out with Tim Wise. Please join me again in two weeks for the next episode of the show. And in the meantime, you can check out my articles at medium.com, as well as my website, www.timwise.org. And follow the show on Facebook at Speak Out with Tim Wise, on Twitter at Speak Out Tim Wise, as well as on Instagram. Take care and join us again in two weeks.